So now let us hear the word of God from Song of Solomon, chapter 2. And the, the title of this message is Christ to the Church, Let Me See Thy Countenance. Song of Solomon, chapter 2. I am the rose of Sharon and the lily of the valleys. As the lily among the thorns, so is my love among the daughters. As the apple tree among the trees of the woods, so is my beloved among the sons. I sat down under his shadow with great delight, and his fruit was sweet to my taste. He brought me into the banqueting house, and his banner over me was love. Stay me with flagons, comfort me with apples, for I am sick of love. His left hand is under my head, and his right hand doth embrace me. I charge you, O O ye daughters of Jerusalem, by the rose and by the hinds of the field, that ye stir not up, nor awake my love, till he please. The voice of my beloved, behold, he cometh, leaping upon the mountains, skipping upon the hills. My beloved is like a roe or a young heart. Behold, he standeth, he standeth behind our wall. He looketh forth at the windows, showing himself through the lattice. My beloved spake and said unto me, Rise up, my love, my fair one, and come away. For lo, the winter is past, the rain is over and gone, the flowers appear on the earth, and the time of the singing of birds is come, and the voice of the turtle is heard in our land. The fig tree putteth forth her green figs, and the vines with the tender grapes have a good smell. Arise, my love, my fair one, and come away. O my dove that art in the cleft of the rock, in the secret places of the stairs, let me see thy countenance, let me hear thy voice, for sweet is thy voice, and thy countenance is comely. Take us the foxes, the little foxes that spoil the vines, for our vines have tender grapes. My beloved is mine, and I am his. He feedeth among the lilies. Until the day break and the shadows flee away, turn, my beloved, and be thou like a roe or a young heart upon the mountains of Bethar. We've come to the end of the second chapter in this most excellent song. Solomon wrote uh, 1,005 songs. Of all of them, this is the very best. Why? Not because it stirs up thoughts of human love, not because it evokes for us thoughts of love and human uh, intimacy between a husband and between a wife. That's not the reason. Even though it may, may make us think of these things, that's not the reason. No, this is the most excellent of songs because it points us, it directs us to lofty thoughts of Christ and his church, even as we see in this passage before us this, this afternoon. The correct way to interpret the song is to search out the spiritual significance, to search out the the way the words direct us to think about the relationship between Christ and his church and how we relate to Christ and how we experience our, our walking with Christ, the highs and the lows of following after Christ. Uh, this is the way to interpret. Uh, the we're, we're to look for the tender ways in which the Lord deals with his people. All of it is here in the Song of Solomon. If the Lord gives the eyes to see it, it's here. And since uh, this is, as we said, a a description of the way that Christ is with the church and the way that the church is with Christ, uh, with Christ, uh, the head of the church, there are challenges for us in in this song. Will we measure up when we examine our own relationship with the Lord our own way and our manner with the Lord. Will we measure up? Will we be as the song describes us to be? Christ will not change. Christ will be unto the church everything that he is represented to be in the song. But will we be that to Christ? Will we measure up to the shared experience of the church as we read these things in the Song of Solomon? Will we heed the words that Christ uses in this song when he speaks to his church? Will we, will we heed these things? And follow his commands and his ways with the church. Will we do as our Lord says? That's another part of the challenge. Well, in this particular portion of the song, there are two voices here. First, we have the king speaking of the bride. That's that's in the first few verses. And then in the second few verses, we have the church, we have the bride making an answer to the king and making a request for the king. 
Now, with this in mind, we'll take the passage up under just, just two headings, and then we'll close with some application. First heading, that Christ urges the church not to be elusive, not to hide, not to be elusive. The Lord's words here to the church indicate that he would have the church not stay hidden as a frightened dove, but to come forth and to, to be with him in fellowship and communion openly. And so that is under the first heading. The second heading, the church urges Christ to come over the gulf and to join the church uh, more fully with haste, like a roe or like a hind, says the church. Come over, come over the mountain to encourage the church, to bless the church in these things. Now, with the Lord's help, these things will become more meaningful. The picture will become uh, more clear as we look at these, these, these things in the word of God. And may the Lord give us a heart to long for these things, to desire them, and to respond to Christ in such a way as we see put forth here as a pattern for us. Our first heading, Christ urges the church not to be elusive, not to stay hidden, not to bury its head into the rock. Christ knows that the church is skittish. Christ knows that we're frail. He remembers that we are but dust. He knows the church is frightened at times. He knew this about his disciples. He dealt with them very tender, uh, tenderly and patiently. He knows that we, as the church, are like doves, searching, looking for some protection from the hostile world, searching for some protection from the, pre the predators that, that circle above or from the waves or from the sun or from uh, things like this. We're searching for protection. And so Christ openly invites and says in verse 14, O oh my dove that art in the clefts of the rock in the secret places of the stairs. Christ openly calls for his dove, his church, to hide itself in him, in him, the rock, and calling his church the dove. He's already said in chapter, uh, chapter 1, verse 15, that the church, that the bride has dove's eyes. This is how he has described the church, meaning the church is meek, soft, submissive toward the Lord Jesus Christ, toward the head of the church, with dove's eyes that are not beady, proud, uh, not not uh, uh, not ambitious, but soft. And so Christ calls the church his dove. Now we can glean some truths from that description of the church because it's not an arbitrary thing. Christ didn't just pull it out of out of air. He uses it for a reason. We can consult other portions of the word of God. We can consult Christian experience to flesh out the meaning here. Now, here's what one commentator, uh, commentator uh, John Gill, he says about the Lord calling the church his dove. The dove is a creature innocent and harmless, beautiful, cleanly and chaste, sociable and fruitful, weak and timorous of a mournful voice. And swift in flying, all which is suitable to the church and people of God. They are harmless and inoffensive in their lives and conversations. They are beautiful through the righteousness of Christ on them and the grace of the Spirit on them. And they are clean through the, through the word that Christ has spoken and having their hearts purified by faith. They are as chaste virgins espoused to Christ and their love to him is single and unfeigned. They cleave to him and are fruitful in grace and good works. And the church being espoused to Christ brings forth many souls unto him in regeneration. Saints carry on a social worship and delight in each other's company. They are weak and timorous, being persecuted and oppressed by the men of the world and mourn for their own sins and for others' sins. And often for the loss of Christ's presence, they mourn. And they're swift in flying to him for safety and for protection. So as we see, there are many parallels. There are many good reasons why the Lord has called his church uh, his dove and why the Lord would say unto his church, my dove, and even describe the church as being hidden inside the rock, going to the rock for safety. The dove flies to the rock for safety when the dove is frightened, when the dove is oppressed, when there are predators circling over the head of the dove. 
when the, the dove is mourning, when the dove's mourning for sin, the, the dove goes to the rock. And this is good. Christ invites the dove to go to the rock, to find refuge, to find safety, to find communion and fellowship with him. Go to the rock. Uh, Psalm 61, from the end of the earth will I cry unto thee when, I, when my heart is overwhelmed, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. So it is right, it is good. Christ says, go to the rock. The Lord is a rock. The Lord is a fortress. The righteous will call on the name of the Lord and run into the fortress and they will be saved. The Lord is a rock and it is right. And Christ says that the church, the dove is not just in the rock, but in the clefts of the rock, in the crags of the rock, in the holes of the rock. You see, the church, unlike any other society, unlike any other people, the church has the privilege to go to the rock that was cleft for the forgiveness of sin. Christ, the rock of ages, the rock that was broken open, the rock with hiding places that will, will really protect the people of God, and they will find forgiveness for their sins. An end to their mourning when they go to the rock that has been cleft. And so Christ says, my dove that art in the cleft of the rocks. What a joy it is to be able to go to the rock and not to be as a dove that flies and flies and flies, cannot find anywhere to find protection, or as a traveler that wanders and wanders and wanders among a barren wood, no sight of the green tree, of the apple tree. What a joy it is to see the tree, to sit under its shade, to reach forth to take the apple and to taste of the apple, or to be the dove that sees the rock, that finds the hollow, that finds the cleft, and says, could that cleft be for me? Could that rock be broken for me? Could I find respite and relief in that rock? And the Lord Jesus Christ says, yes, and more to the church, the church that goes to the rock, to the cleft of the rock. Now this should be a part of our message to the lost of this world. When we go and speak to the lost of the world, we say to them, the rock was cleft for you. The rock is open. You may go to the rock. You may, you may fly to the rock and be shielded at the rock, even from the wrath of God for all your sins. You may go to the rock. Christ is the rock that was split open. Christ was broken, he was bruised, he was chastised for the transgressions of sinners just as we are. And so we may go to that rock that has been broken open and resort to him. The rock is open, the rock is open. And the rock is open for more than uh, just fleeing for shelter. Christ goes on a little further. He says that his dove is in the secret places of the stairs. The secret places of the stairs. This is another way of saying all the many holes, all the many footholds that you could see in the, in the side of a cliff that are, are perfect for birds to, to rest and to be fruitful and enjoy, uh, and enjoy a life that they would not know other places. And so Christ speaks of these secret places of the stairs, uh, speaking to the church about, about sweet, intimate communion with the Lord Jesus Christ in private worship, where we could go to the secret places and the stairs and be with Christ anytime we want, going to him in prayer and, and as it were, nestling ourselves close to the Lord Jesus Christ in prayer. So all of this is good. All of this is right. All of this is, is truly glorious, but this is not where the Lord ends his speech. He continues. He goes on in the, in the, uh, in the words following. He says, let me see thy countenance. Let me hear thy voice for sweet is thy voice and thy, thy count, uh, countenance is comely. And so this is where Christ begins to tell the church, don't be so elusive. Don't, don't bury your head so, uh, so deeply in me that I cannot see your face. Because Christ desires to see the countenance of the church, to hear the voice of the church. He wants to see the church out in the world. He wants to see the church publicly praising him out in the world. It's Christ's pleasure for the church to be out 
of the catacombs in the public eye, worshiping Christ publicly, uh, shining, as it were, as a city on a hill. He wants to see the face of the church in the world. It's his pleasure. It's his prayer. As he says in John 17, 15, he says, I pray not that thou shouldst take them out of the world, but that, that, that thou shouldst keep them from evil. So Christ prays that they should not be taken out of the world, but that they should be in the world, that they should be shining in the world, visible in the world. It's as Christ says to his disciples, ye are the light of the world. A city that is set upon a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick. And it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Matthew 5, 14 to 16. In other words, private worship, secret worship is, is very good. And hidden worship, underground worship, it may be necessary in different times and places in the history of the church. It may be necessary and right. But Christ says, let me see thy countenance. The Lord loveth the gates of Zion more than the dwellings of Jacob. Amen. Psalm 80, 87, 2. Christ says, let me see thy countenance. At the earliest possible convenience, the earliest possible way, let me hear thy voice out in the world. Let me hear the church praising, praising uh, the Lord in every place. Let me see men lifting holy hands in every place. All over, let me see it. Because it is the gathered worship, the public worship of the Lord that delights, uh, that delights above and beyond the secret worship in the dwellings of Jacob. Knowing these things should give us certain energy in, uh, in our gatherings, shouldn't it? Knowing that the Lord says he takes the light, he loves the, he loves the countenance of the church. He loves the voice of the praises. It should be energizing to us as we gather, even as we are, are here week after week and uh, the, the flesh is, is weary at times. No, this should energize us that the Lord loves the public gathering. He loves the assembly. And, and this should also prick us if and when we are ever providentially hindered from assembling as many have been and as many continue to be, how it should prick us. How it should prick us. That, the, that Christ says, don't stay as the frightened dove. Don't stay as the frightened bird nestling secretly within me. Don't, don't stay as that. No, there's a time to venture forth. There's a time to assemble. There's a time to worship Christ with his people and to do bold things in the public eye. In the, in the public square to do bold things in the service of the Lord so that he may have as he desires. He says, the voice of my, of my uh, people, it is sweet. That is the thrust of Christ's words here. Let me see thy countenance. Yet there's one more side to this before we move on. There's one more side. Look at the verse right after verse 14, verse 15. As soon as Christ calls his church out of the rock uh, to go out and to, to make motions in accordance with what Christ is saying to take steps to, to have a visible presence in the world what happens? Verse 15 Take us the foxes, the little foxes that spoil the vines for our vines have tender grapes there's going to be these foxes that they weren't there before now these little foxes they're going to be able to, uh, to make trouble as they couldn't when, when the dove was, was hidden in the rock. And so Christ changes the metaphor a little bit and he says, be careful for the foxes, take, the, take us the foxes. You see, if the church was, was nothing more than personal and private, uh, private intercourse with Christ, uh, relationship with Christ and his people, there'd be no foxes. Each of us could do a private religion in our own homes and uh, no one would be the wiser. No one would be the wiser. Yet that's not as Christ has, has called and commanded. He's, he said, let me see thy countenance. He's called his, his disciples to be out in the world. And along with that will come these foxes. Along with that will come these little predators. 
This is part of being the visible church and operating in the world. Christ said, I, I pray not that that would take them out of the world because they will be in the world. Christ says that, that in the world there will be, uh, I send you forth as sheep among wolves. And so it's part of it. It's, it's as God has designed that it would be this way. There will be these little predators, these, these uh, predators seeking to destroy and to make trouble in the church. They'll go after the vines. They'll go after the tender grapes to do damage. Now, this could take the form of, uh, of outward persecution. It could also take the form of some inward strife, internal strife, disagreements that, that come up between believers. We're not perfect. We're not sinless. We'll have disagreements as we assemble together, gather together, and form the church and these societies together. We'll have disagreements. And there's going to be risks. There's going to be partings of ways. Think of any new church plant, a group of believers interested in forming a church. And there's, it's an exciting time, but it's also a challenging time because there will be little foxes that run in. There will be divisions, disagreements, personality uh, clashes in any church, especially in a young church, a new church, little foxes that go in to try to spoil the vines. In fact, as a general rule, the families that are most committed at the very beginning of any new work of the church may not be the families that are there three, four, five years later, maybe other families, because of these little foxes that spoil the vines. They run in and the grapes are not protected, the tender grapes. And so Christ gives warning. He says there are these little foxes, they must be, they must be dealt with. Now there's also, there's also external persecution. There's, there's foxes that seek to ravage the vines. There are those that would want to see the work of the church frustrated from outside the church. There's slanderers, there's accusers, there's persecutors. And if they, they were given the opportunity, these foxes would, would come in and make quick work of the vines and spoil the grapes. And so Christ, knowing all of this, he says, take us the foxes, remove the foxes, deal with the foxes. What's interesting about this language is that Christ seems to be uh, not talking to the entirety of the church, but uh, talking to those that are laborers in the vineyard as, as he is uh, when he says, take us, referring uh, to those that have the ability and the, uh, the call to handle these, these foxes. We could say disciples, we could say uh, gospel ministers, elders. It's elders, it's gospel ministers that are to guard the vineyard, protect the vineyard from the ravages of these little foxes. And it's notable that Christ says, don't wait till they're large, don't wait till they're big, remove them when they're little. And this is a challenge to all who hold office in the church, not to ignore the little foxes, not to wait until uh, they've had time to do their, their damage. Don't suppose, don't suppose that you're doing your duty if you don't guard against these foxes when they're small, if you say they can't do much harm, they can't do much, they're, lo they're so little. No, don't suppose you're doing your duty if you let the little foxes go in in the name of keeping the peace, in the name of keeping, uh, keeping things smooth and not rocking the boat. If you let the little foxes go in, you're not doing your duty as one who holds office in the church. No, Christ says it's the little foxes that can spoil the vines. Just a little leaven, just a small amount of false teaching, just a small dispute that upsets the congregation. These things have a way of spoiling the vines and these things have a way of causing more damage than we could anticipate at the start. And so, brothers and sisters, we must be vigilant and on guard because the grapes are tender. That's what Christ says, the grapes are tender. Yes, Christ rules and his church, he rules his church, he defends his church. But consult your experience and you know that humanly speaking, the grapes are very tender in any church. 
those that are more recent to faith in Christ, uh, those who are more recent to a robust, reformed type of church. These are tender grapes. These are people that may be uh, turned aside very easily to follow bad examples. The grapes are tender. All the more reason to guard against the little foxes, as Christ says. These little heresies, little disputes and conflicts that rise in the church, guard against them and, and ask yourself, are you helping in this? Are you assisting in this? Or are you part of the problem? Are you contributing to it? With having a wrong attitude and with having a bad example, are you contributing to it? Have you been out digging little holes in the vineyards as these foxes do, gnawing at these vines, causing the tender grapes to suffer? It's a, it's a whole church effort to be on guard for these little foxes. And so the Lord says to take them seriously. The Lord says have no tolerance for them. No tolerance for, for error of any kind. No tolerance for disturbances in the church that are unnecessary. Have no tolerance for them. Uh, the, the notes in the Geneva Bible, they're simple and to the point as usual when they say, suppress the heretics while they are young, that is when they begin to show their malice and destroy the vine of the Lord. So nip it in the bud. When it's detected, deal with it. Don't let it go, all, go along to another day. Don't defer. Don't, in the name of keeping things smooth, uh, overlook it says the Lord. No, take us the little foxes. The, the grapes are tender. The grapes are, are too important, too valuable not to do so. And so all of this is challenging. All of this will come with difficulty. Yet it's what the Lord calls us to do. It's what the Lord delights in. He says, let me see thy countenance. Let me hear thy voice. He wants us to be together. He wants us to gather. He wants us to praise him. He wants us to be visible. Which brings us to our second point, our second heading. We have a response from the church. We have words from the church and a request. The church urges Christ to come to the church, encourage the church, coming over the mountain, over the gulf. The final verses in this passage, they go back to the voice of the church and they express delight and joy. First of all, delight and joy in being cared for by Christ. Verse 16, it says, my beloved is mine, and I am his. He feedeth among the lilies. Talk about knowing your first love. As we've heard this day already, my beloved is mine, and I am his. That's, that's what it is to know our first love, to rejoice in this and to, to delight in this, that, that my beloved is mine. Of all prizes, my beloved is, is the best. Of all treasures, my beloved is the greatest. To belong to him and for him to belong to me. Think of the words that the Lord uh, said unto Abraham and how precious these words are. And I will establish my covenant between me and thee and thy seed after thee in their generation and for an everlasting covenant to be a God unto thee and to thy seed after thee. Genesis 17, 7. What would you trade that for? Anything that the world could offer is, is, uh, is, is worthless. No, to be the beloved of Christ and to have Christ as our beloved, that is the treasure. That is the treasure. Though we are yet earthen vessels, Easily broken, yet we have this treasure if we have Christ. We are his, he is ours. To belong to Christ and have Christ as the head of the church, it's the church's greatest rejoicing, the church's greatest treasure, the church's greatest prize to have Christ. There's really nothing sadder than a Christless church. If you think about it, a church without Christ, a church where Christ has been brushed to the side, rejected as the head, Christ's laws have been cast out and, and then replaced with man's laws, man's onerous laws, burdensome laws. What a sad thing. What a dismal thing 
Oh, you should run from such a thing as a Christless church. Better to be in no church at all than a Christless church. There's no safety in such a place, just tyranny. There's no healing in such a place, just harming. There's no victory over the world, just compromise with the world. There's no feeding among the lilies, just starvation out in the cold in a Christless church, in a church that doesn't have Christ as its prize. There's no feeding among the lilies. The church rejoices in having Christ as the beloved and the the church says, he feedeth me among the lilies. He feedeth me out among the lilies. Now, earlier in chapter two, the lily was already mentioned as a beautiful flower that grows over all the hills of, of Israel. And Christ has said that he, that he is like the lily of the valley, speaking of himself as being beautiful and, 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 and widespread. Christ's gospel is preached indiscriminately over the hills of this earth. And so he is like the lily of the valleys. He's beautiful to behold. And he's around every corner. He's preached on every place. He's preached throughout the whole earth. And so now the church says, he feedeth me among the lilies. He takes me out to feed me. And I can see traces of him. I can see him everywhere I look. When I read his word, when I, uh, when I gather with, with his people, I see him. I understand him. I recognize him. And so the Lord feeds his people among the lilies. What a privilege it is. How delightful. You see, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the the mouth of God. It's what Christ responded uh, when Satan tempted him. Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Yet, As the Lord nourishes his people, it's better than bread. It's not just crusty. It's not just dry. It's better. He feedeth me among the lilies. It's beautiful. It's delightful. And as we are fed among the lilies, as we hear from the word of God, there are so many things in the word of God that enlarge the majesty of the word of God to us and that delight us down to our toes. We're we're excited. We're excited. We're we're captivated by the beauty of what the Lord has given us in his word. As we read through his word and as we see the prints of the Lord Jesus Christ in every page. He feedeth me among the lilies. There's no better place to be fed than to be among the lilies. Well, this is truly a blessing and, and a privilege. Yet there's... A final verse here, there's a request that the church makes. Verse 17, a a further request. Verse 17, until the day break and the shadows flee away, turn, my beloved, and be thou like a roe or a young heart upon the mountains of Bethar. So this is the request. Until the day break, until the shadows flee away. Starting with the nighttime, the church saying, yes, it seems, it feels as though at this time it is the night. So until the day breaks, until the shadows flee away, we're starting in the nighttime. The request begins at the nighttime. In this song, the references to the nighttime, they're typically understood to be as either images of adversity or times in which the church is unable to view Christ, to see Christ in his fullness. And so the request it, it places the church in the nighttime. And it says, until the daybreak, until the shadows flee away, it says, turn, my beloved, and come. Be like a roe, be like a young heart upon the mountains of Beth Air. The ancient church can see Christ through the promises, but he's still darkly. Through the promises, through the prophecies, not fully. The ancient church, it is as if it's a time of, of darkness. Earlier in the chapter, chapter 2, the church said that, that the church could see Christ as though he standeth behind a wall, only catching the faintest glimpse of him. Uh, this is similar. This is similar. The church saying that it's like it's being in, in, in a nighttime, yet there is a day that will break, says the church. The church anticipates it. The church expects it, saying, until the day break, until the shadows flee away. So the church 
understands and under, and knows that there is a day coming. There is a, a light to dawn upon the church and that the shadows will flee away. The shadows being the old ordinances, the types, the rituals, the, the, the ceremonies, these shadows, they will flee away. And Christ will be revealed in his, in his glorious fullness. And so this is what the church anticipates when the church says, until the day break, until the shadows flee away. And so the church says, turn, O Lord, hasten, come so that we may be encouraged by thee and know thee after, uh, know thee in a, in, a, in a deeper way, in a more full way. Come over like a hind, like a young uh, heart over the mountains of Bether. Now, there may be some wordplay here since this word Bether, it has the same root as the word divide, uh, divide in the Hebrew. And now besides this, there are mountains that are uh, in, in a region by Bethabara. And these mountains, uh, they have a similar name. They're also dotted with these deep ravines making them almost impassable. And so with this word play and with this geography, we're beginning to see a picture of an impassable gulf, mountain, a mountain range with these ravines, a divide. And so the church says, turn, turn, Lord, and come over like a swift deer, like a, like a, uh, a young heart over this divide. We want the day to break. We want the light to appear. We're still in this darkness. We know it's coming. And so they say, turn, be thou like a roe or a young heart upon the mountains of Beth Air and speedily come to us. We need thy encouragement, says the church, as they wait and as they wait and as they wait. Now, you know, we make a similar petition to the Lord in our own time. When we take up the words of the Lord's Prayer, what do we say? Thy kingdom come. Very similar petition. It's a prayer for Christ's return to be hastened and for his glorious uh, return and triumph to come quickly. And so did you know that the ancient church prophetically prayed the same thing? They prophetically prayed the Lord's Prayer before the Lord gave the Lord's Prayer when they said, Turn, be thou like a roe, be thou like a, ro a young heart upon the mountains of Bethar and come over. We can't come to you. There's a divide. We're waiting. We're in darkness. Yet we know the light is going to shine. We know it's coming. And so the church says, come, come speedily. And we pray the same thing. On this side of the first coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, yet we are, are without the Lord Jesus Christ in this world. And so we say, come, thy kingdom come. We, we say the same thing. Even though we walk in the day, the gospel day has dawned. We would see that Christ would come back and put in a final end to all of his enemies. We would see Christ come back and break the power of darkness forever. We, we would pray the same thing. Although we are aware that certain things must be fulfilled in order for this coming to come, uh, this coming to take place, we still pray this. Here's how this is all uh, put together in, in Revelation 22.20. He which testify, testifieth these things saith, Surely I come quickly. Amen. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. This is our prayer. Praying the same thing as the ancient church prayed, only with a different understanding, a new understanding. But yet the, the heart is, is the very same. We, we seek that the Lord would come and come to us speedily. Well, we've seen in this passage how the church first resorts to the Lord Jesus Christ as a frightened dove and finds shelter in the, in the Lord Jesus Christ in, in the cleft of the rock, flies to the rock that's been broken and, and escapes the birds of prey and goes there when the dove is mourning, mourning for sin and, and finds deliverance from an evil conscience and from the wrath of God. We've seen that. And as usual with the Song of Solomon, we can take a step back and ask ourselves, do we match that in our own experience as we think about what's described in the church uh, for the church in the song, do we match that? Are we as Christ's dove? Are we meek, soft, 
submissive are our eyes to the church as dove's our eyes, uh, dove's eyes are? Are we harmless and inoffensive in our life and conversations? Are we beautiful through the righteousness of Christ, the grace of the Spirit? Are we clean through the word of Christ? Are we as chaste virgins espoused to Christ because of his work of redemption? Is our love for the Lord Jesus Christ single and unfeigned? Cleaving to the Lord Jesus Christ in times of trouble and in times of, of peace and prosperity? Are we fruitful in grace and are, are we carrying on a social worship that delights in the company of other believers as birds of a feather flock together? We can, we can consult our own experience and we can see if we match these things as the word of God says we should. Are we this way or are there areas in which we need to become like a dove? Be as Christ describes. The last part here touches on, uh, the, the part in verse 15 also touches on the, the going forth. Let me see thy countenance. Let me hear thy voice for sweet is thy voice and thy countenance is is comely. Are we matching this? Are we going forth as we should? Are we pushing the bounds of making public declarations and statements for the honor of the Lord Jesus Christ as he would have us do in the public in the public eye? Are we pushing against those bounds? Uh, are we gathering with with great zeal to worship the Lord. The Lord loves the gates of Zion more than the dwellings of Jacob. Or do we, as, as many have done, do we content ourselves with alternatives? Uh, content ourselves with excuses? Uh, content ourselves with delaying these things? I fear many in the wider church have lost sight of the Lord's pleasure in the gathered worship of Christ. And I fear that many have, have not seen a problem with alternatives and not seen a problem with foregoing the assembling for long periods of time, so much longer than, than would be prudent, so much longer than would be acceptable to anyone who has a a balanced view of what the Lord seeks from his people. I fear this, but it's easy to point fingers. It's more profitable to look in the mirror of the word and simply ask ourselves, where is our zeal? Where is our, our passion for these things? As the Lord says, where is our obedience? Where is our attitude in these things? Are we just dragging ourselves because it's an obligation, because we know it's expected, or is there an animation of zeal from the what from the, what the Lord says to do, knowing that the Lord says, "Let me see thy countenance. Let me hear thy voice. Thy countenance is comely. Thy voice is sweet." Is this what animates us? Is this what motivates us? The pleasure of the Lord Jesus Christ, and to have the gift of putting of bringing that pleasure to Him, and having Him see His desire in the church. We are His church. He is our head. Will we not delight in giving him his desire in the church? Yet, as we do this, we must acknowledge there will be hazards, there will be dangers, there will be risks. As Christ says, little foxes, they'll come in and they're not, they're not something to be trifled with. They're not some small thing. They, they will be able to do damage to the tender grapes. They will be able to cause trouble. And so again, we must be quite vigilant in this. We must pray that those who do hold office in the church would be vigilant and, and take action if necessary and not to uh, be complacent about letting the foxes come in. Don't be complacent. We must pray and we must do whatever we, we can do to assist that those who do hold office would follow after the example of the Lord Jesus Christ how does the Lord Jesus Christ defend his church? He not only casts out the little foxes, he casts out the wolves. He casts out the great beasts. He slays the dragon. He, does, he gives of him his own self. His own body is broken for the church. Lays down his life for the church. So we must pray that, that those that do hold office, that all of us, that we would follow in this. We would seek to serve the church of the Lord Jesus Christ after this example. 
And then finally, will we echo the very request made by the, by the ancient church, made by the, the bride in the Song of Solomon, over the mountains of Bethar, be like a, a, a roe, be like a young hind, a young heart over the mountains of Bethar. Come, O Lord Jesus. How we long to see the countenance of the Lord Jesus Christ as he longs to see ours. How we long to hear the voice of the Lord Jesus Christ saying, well done, thou good and faithful servant. What, what a longing we have for these things. Will we, as the, the bride does, call out for these things sincerely, sincerely in our prayer, saying, even so, come, Lord Jesus. May the Lord bless his word to our hearts. Let's stand together for prayer.